Well, uh, thank you for all for turning up and it's uh, lovely to see you here. Uh, hopefully you're not too distracted by dreams of Christmas. Um, so today on the uh, junior program, uh, we have uh, going first, uh, James Fagan, um, who will be uh, presenting to you uh, 2022 in review, uh, five key cases to remember. I'm just going through some of uh, the decisions that have shaped 2022. Uh, and then you will have myself, here's Digby, following up, uh, and I will be dealing with uh, four smaller cases that show just some practical tips to deal with evidence um, and how you can uh, manage cases more smoothly and simply. Um, we will leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so uh, unless your question is particularly burning, um, perhaps uh, wait till the end of each speaker's talk um, so they can get around to it. Um, we'll be able to see if you raise a hand. Um, I think that covers all of the uh, groundwork. And therefore, James, over and away to you. Thanks. Uh Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this, the last of the Radcliffe Chambers junior programmes for 2022, uh, and this time on the topic of insolvency. Um, I'll be giving you a brief presentation on uh, what I think are some of the uh, most important or at least interesting cases, particularly from a practical perspective, uh, coming out of 2022. Um, and in order to not over overwhelm people, I've, only, I, I've, I've been selective, but I've gone with five. Um, and the five effectively cover five individual topics. Uh, the first is uh, section 127 uh, of the Insolvency Act 86, so post-petition payments. Uh, service out in the personal bankruptcy uh, scenario and the meaning of uh, residence in England and Wales. A very recent case on uh, COMI uh, of companies, um, which uh, deals effectively with virtual or letterbox companies. A, a case uh, uh, that highlights effectively the difficulties in challenging liquidator decision making. And finally, a case that I'm sure everyone's uh, heard about, uh, but always useful to uh, highlight uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Sopana uh, on director's duties and specifically the creditor's duties. So uh, without further ado, we'll move on to the first one, uh, which is the re-change tail solutions case. Um, in this case, liquidators applied for uh, recovery of sums paid uh, by the company, Changetel, uh, in the period between the presentation of a winding up petition and the making of the order. Uh, the judgment concerned uh, five payments totaling close to £50,000 made to uh, by the company to the respondent, uh, G4S Secure Solutions UK Limited, for the provision of security services. Uh, the respondent resisted the application on several grounds, including that the claim was time barred under Section 9 of the Limitation Act 1980, uh, that the court should validate the payments, uh, and or, or alternatively, uh, the respondent had a change of position defence to the restitutionary claim that arises out of Section 127. Uh, ICC Judge Barber found against the respondent on all points. Uh, granting the application and ordering repayment. Uh, the case is of interest because I think it provides a useful uh, piece of guidance on, on two key issues. Uh, firstly, on the issue of limitation periods under section 127. And then secondly, the clarification as to the availability of the change of position defence uh, under this provision uh, and how it applies. Uh, on the limitation argument, the respondent had argued that the application was time barred because it was issued more than six years after the company had made the payments. Uh, what the judge said is that when you look at what section 127 is there to do, uh, it's there to preserve the pari passu principle in a liquidation. Uh, and that pari passu principle or that purpose is only brought into operation by the very making of the winding up order. So until that order is made, uh, the principle of pr protecting pari passu is only prospectively engaged. Uh, in other words, the legal consequence of the transaction at the time it was carried out effectively depends on what happens at a much later date. So as a result, the judge held, the cause of action under section 127 is not in fact complete until the making of the winding up order. And therefore, for the purposes of uh, bringing uh, an, a, a claim or an application under Section 127, uh, the time period does not begin to run until uh, the date, not, does not begin to run until the winding up order, which is necessarily a later date um, than the date of payment. Uh, 
uh, and accordingly the limitation argument uh, was dismissed. Uh, on the subject of change of position, uh, what the court held was that in principle, the change of position defense is available. However, the circumstances in which it can succeed are in fact constrained uh, in exactly the same way and for the same reasons as the exercise of the court's discretion to validate post-petition payments. Therefore, the applicable principles governing um, the change of position defence under section 127 are the same which govern an application uh, or the circumstances in which the court will uh, order that post-petition payments be validated, uh, which are set out in the case of Express Electrical Distributors and Beavis. On the facts of this case, therefore, why this argument failed, the change of position defence, is because the validation argument had failed. And effectively, the respondent's evidence did not establish that it had incurred costs in connection uh, with the security services, uh, which it required the payments uh, to cover uh, outside of their ordinary course of things. Uh, and nor did the evidence establish that it had changed its position in the belief that the payments which were po made post petition were in fact valid and therefore uh, the defense failed. So I think this is a key case because um, it provides effectively two fresh pieces of guidance. One is in respect of limitation, which is of course very key whenever you're making any application um, in court to know exactly when time's gonna run out. And I think particularly from a uh, office holder perspective, knowing that you have a bit more time in respect to post petition payments is going to be beneficial. Uh, and secondly, in relation to change of defense, uh, change of position defense, um, it's obviously good to know it exists. That's a good opportunity for those who may have to plead this. However, the fact is it is constrained. And unless you're going to effectively come in under the same principles which govern validation, you're probably not going to get anywhere with that defense. Turning now to service A. Um, this is a case uh, brought uh, involving a member of the Saudi royal family uh, who was petitioned for bankruptcy. Um, the background to proceedings is that uh, the petitioning creditor, uh, Mobile Telecommunications, have been awarded over 800 million US dollars in arbitration proceedings. Uh, cost orders uh, were made against the debtor in follow on high court proceedings, which amounted to some uh, £639,000. That sum that was itself then the subject of a st statutory demand, which gave rise to the petition. Uh, at the time of the petition, um, His Royal Highness uh, was not in the country, and accordingly the petitioner had to obtain permission for service out of the jurisdiction. The uh, On the 14th of December 2020, the uh, Deputy ICC Judge Schaffer dismissed an application to set aside permission to serve the petition out of the jurisdiction, uh, which had been granted ex parte by uh, ICC Judge Jones. Uh, this was appealed, uh, and that this was the subject of this case. Um, in, in essence, there is a gateway for service out uh, under section 265 2B1 of the Insolvency Act, uh, that a bankruptcy petition may be served on a person who was not domiciled within England and Wales, if they have a place of residence in England and Wales in the three years prior to the petition being served. The uh, first point that comes out of this case is the standard of proof which applies uh, on an application for permission to serve out of the jurisdiction. Uh, it's not a standard of uh, balance of probabilities that they in fact have a place of residence and are therefore amenable to the court's jurisdiction. It's a lower standard of proof, merely that there's a good arguable case that they have a place of residence in England and Wales. Um, that's going to be useful at this at the permission stage. But of course, it's important to remember that when you get to the uh, later stage, if, if there's a challenge to jurisdiction on the substantive hearing of the petition, the higher standard of balance of probabilities will apply. In terms of well, what is meant by place of residence in England and Wales. It is not the same as saying the debtor is resident in England and Wales. It's simply that, uh, borrowing the old phrase from the uh, previous rules, 
that, that they effectively have a, a, a domicile in the sense that they have a dwelling house. The prior case law had established that de facto control of a property in England and Wales is not a necessary condition to finding that the debtor has a place of residence, nor is ownership res uh, necessary. Therefore, uh, whether they, the debtor has legal or equitable title uh, is not necessarily going to be required. Obviously, if you can show that, that's good. You're going to have a stronger case, but it's not going to be fatal to show that, well, while they don't own a property within the country, they do in fact have access um, with a degree of permanence and uh, repeated use um, of, of a property. Um, what the case law said is that the ownership uh, are simply, it would be illustrations of the broad range of factual considerations uh, which may be relevant in determining whether an individual has a place of residence in the country um, within the meaning of the statute. Um, and, and what the court says is that the expression uh, place of residence is to be given its ordinary meaning and the assessment depends on all the facts which includes the length of occupation. Um, in this case uh, there was a broad range of factors that were considered. Um, you'll see in the slide there the what the judge sort of focused on as being the high level kind of factors that were then assessed. Uh, on the facts of this case, um, the debtor had a property in London where his mother had lived and where he had lived whilst a student during the 1980s and 1990s. And that had been his place of residence within the jurisdiction. His mother had given him express permission to stay there at any time, and that was continuing permission. He had registered for council tax on the property whilst a student and remained registered up until 2019. Um, however, he had not occupied the property for the three years prior to the petition being served. Um, and in early 2018, he had stayed at a larger property in London that belonged to his wife and children and which could accommodate his entourage. Um, and finally, he had not returned to the UK since 2018. Um, because he would have been in prison for contempt uh, for breach of a previous court order had he done so. So notwithstanding the fact that he'd only lived in the jurisdiction uh, continuously some 20 years ago, um, that he, he, he used the property on and off. And in fact, the last time he'd been here, he hadn't, and he hadn't been in the jurisdiction for the previous three years. The court, in fact, held that the good arguable case threshold was met, that there was a sufficient regularity um, and uh, of use of the property, along with uh, it being sort of lengthy uses um, and continuing. Uh, and I think what's interesting as well is the fact that, despite the fact that he had not been resident in, or present in the jurisdiction uh, for some three years, uh, four years in fact, um, that was still enough to show that with he had a place of residence for the preceding three years from the date of the petition, in order to ground uh, the argument at uh, the, the application for permission to serve out of the jurisdiction. So I think the takeaway from this case is, uh, again, that lower standard that's applied, but also the fact that if you need be, you can effectively look at a wide range of factors and, and almost get creative in order to get over that jurisdictional threshold. Um, turning to the next case, which is uh, East West Logistics. Uh, this is a case about Comey, so uh, about where uh, companies have their centres of main interest for the purposes of uh, whether there's jurisdiction to uh, wind them up in this country. Um, the facts fairly straightforward. The petitioner had entered into a, a contract with the company under which the uh, petitioner was to ship cargo to Turkmenistan. Uh, the petitioner later claimed that the company was in breach of contract, commenced arbitration proceedings in London uh, and later issued proceedings in the BVI. Uh, the petitioner obtained judgment in default uh, and issued a winding up petition in England uh, in July 2016. Uh, and the winding up order was ultimately made in August 2020. Uh, the company uh, challenged that winding up order on the basis that uh, the courts lacked jurisdiction uh, in, in, and stated that the company, in fact, had its centre of main interest not in England and Wales, uh, but in Malta, where its registered office. Uh, was located. Uh, the appeal against the winding up order was granted, 
and then there was a second appeal to the Court of Appeal. Uh, what the Court of Appeal uh, said is that the lower courts had erred in finding um, that a lack of evidence that the debtor actually carries out any activities at the place of its registered office allows the court to disregard or ignore the legal presumption which is contained in Article 3.1 of the EU regulation, which applied at that time, uh, and, and I should note, still applies on the basis of the retained legislation. Um, effectively, there's a legal presumption that where your registered office is, is where your Comey is, unless there's evidence to the contrary. That's a rebuttable presumption. What the court says is the simple absence of evidence that they carry out any activities where their registered office is, doesn't automatically rebut the presumption. Uh, it's a presumption, it will be easier to rebut the presumption um, on a given set of facts if there is no evidence, but the starting point for any of these cases will be where your registered office is, is where your centre of main interest is. At the second area where the point where the courts below had gone wrong was that they adopted a too narrow of a test to the question of ascertainability. Um, and, and, and what can be relied on to show that the centre of main interests are elsewhere. Um, there was a the use of the concept of a what can a typical third party uh, find out. Um, it did not denote some hypothetical or average creditor uh, to the exclusion of what had been learned by the actual creditors who had dealt with the company. What the uh, company had tried to say is that the only factors or ascertainable uh, facts that can be relied on in order to attempt to shift Comey to somewhere else is something that's known to the public at large and not the private dealings of the company with its creditors as third parties. Uh, the central example that the court gave as to why you can use the uh, dealings with individual creditors is the, uh, is the example of a debtor company who enters into 10 separate and bespoke contracts with 10 separate counterparties with each contract being negotiated and signed by the same representative in the same office and each contract identifying the same representative of the debtor company as being responsible for dealings with the counterparty in respect of all matters arising out of the contract. And what the court said in those circumstances, in the, the matters that would satisfy the test of ascertainability would in fact be the terms of that those contracts, even though the other nine creditors wouldn't in fact know what those other contracts said. Um, the, the reality is it's, it may not go to the overall um, admissibility of the factors. It may be that these are so individual to each creditor that they can't be of much weight in shifting Comey to show that the administration of the company is somewhere other than its registered office. But the court says you can rely on that and it doesn't matter how that information comes to light. So. For example, if that information comes to light by a intervening or supporting creditor putting their contract into evidence, that can be relied on to show that Kobe is elsewhere than the registered office. It doesn't have to be information that's only available to the petitioning creditor. Uh, and in this case, uh, it, was, it, was, it was held that the factors relied on the petitioner did not in fact uh, displace the presumption that the registered office was in Malta. So the, the, what had been relied on was the idea that the contracts uh, with creditors were governed by English law, uh, that they provided for dispute resolution in London, um, that the uh, company had hired English lawyers. None of that showed that their centre of main interest was in fact anywhere else than Malta. And the, the, the distinction is, it's not where physical or commercial operations are, it's where the administrative um, issues that are dealt with by the company. So it's filings, things like that. The, the pure administration is where that's going on. And so that's very important, therefore, when you're dealing with letterbox companies, much like the debtor company in this case, where they may have physical operations or commercial dealings elsewhere in the globe. But what the court is going to want to focus on is where are its administrative matters being dealt with? Uh, do they remain at the registered office or can you point to some other uh, set of factors, um, either widely known or perhaps known only to you as creditor or some other creditors uh, to show that its administrative dealings are elsewhere other than its registered office address. Uh, 
Now we turn to the fourth case, uh, which is re Eden Gate Homes, which deals with uh, challenging liquidator decision making. Uh, facts of this case, fairly straightforward. Uh, the di a director, former director uh, of the company Eden Gate, um, who was also a creditor uh, because of the company's indebtedness towards her in respect of certain loans she made to the company. Uh, challenged a decision by a liquidator to assign claims against her and other family members uh, to a litigation fund. Uh, the claims were for about £1.2 million exclusive of interest, uh, and they related to various things such as director misfeasance, uh, voidable preferences, transactions at an undervalue. Um, the claims were disputed by the director, Mrs Locke, and her, her family. Uh, the fact is that the company had no funds to enable the liquidator to pursue the claims. And so in April 2019, uh, the liquidator received an offer from uh, Manoli to purchase the claims. And in May, the liquidator wrote to Mrs. Locke and her family, warning them that he was contemplating to sell the claims against them. And in the, uh, in the absence of any settlement within a reasonable time. Now, no response was received to that letter. And so in September 2019, the liquidator went ahead, uh, entered into an assignment with Manalit. Mrs. Locke then brought the application uh, to set aside and challenge uh, the liquidator's decision to uh, make that assignment. She argued that the liquidator was under a duty to test the market properly, which included affording her and her family the opportunity to make an offer to acquire the claims and that any failure to do so was perverse in light of the evidence that she and her family would have been prepared to pay a reasonable amount uh, to acquire the claims. And the challenge was brought under section uh, 1685 of the Insolvency Act. Um, what the court said uh, in dismissing the challenge and upholding the dismissal on appeal is that when the court is faced with a challenge to a director's decision-making under uh, 168 subsection 5. There's a two-stage test. Um, what the person has to show is first that they are a person who is aggrieved by an act or decision of the liquidator, and secondly, that the applicant has a legitimate interest in obtaining the relief sought. And now this isn't a legitimate interest in the sense that they themselves alone have legitimate interest. Um, it's a legitimate interest which is effectively not adverse to the interests of the, the creditors as a whole. Um, so where the application to set aside a disposal of property by the liquidator, an applicant will have a legitimate interest if it is acting in the interests of creditors generally. So typically that will be the case where the effect of the relief sought uh, will be to maximize the assets of the estate. So um, say that we would have paid more um, or, or, or that, they're not, that they're not getting the best deal out there. Uh, but an applicant will not have standing if the relief is contrary to the interests of creditors. Uh, and that's typically where, what if the application succeeds, it will result in a lesser recovery uh, to the creditors as a whole. Um, so that's obviously a difficult position where you are the defendant uh, of a potential claim challenging the assignment of that claim because the assignee has an interest in getting the biggest recovery possible in that litigation. The defendant uh, in a claim seeking to, to assign it is looking to pay the least amount possible. So there's a mismatch there against what's beneficial to the creditors. Um, the court went on to then consider on the facts, because this was a final hearing, what if those um, standing thresholds had been gotten past? Uh, and that's where the question of perversity comes in. Um, what is meant by perversity uh, is what is in, described in the authorities as an objective question. Um, it's whether the liquidator uh, acted in a matter so utterly unreasonable and absurd that no reasonable person would have acted in that way. It's the classic Wed Wednesbury unreasonable test again that we see popping up all over. Um, it is described as a formidable test um, because there may be a variety of reasons for a liquidator to do um, any, any of these assignments or to make certain decisions. Um, it, there, there might be per 
plenty of different commercial justifications that may may in his wine and provided those are normal reasonable uh, commercial decisions it's going to be very hard to challenge uh, on the basis of perversity and what what was effectively held here was that while the communications from the liquidator may not have been ideal um it was not perverse to not assign these claims to the defendant in circumstances where uh, the director hadn't responded to the uh, the letter saying it'll be assigned if there's no uh, settlement within a reasonable time. And there was simply no evidence that they would have been the director would have been prepared to pay more uh, than the assignee. Um, and, and so that failure to effectively say, well, will engage in a bidding war with the assignee in order to um, to take assignment ourselves is effectively going to be fatal to any defendant's uh, decision to challenge. What the court did say, though, is that it's not um, it's it's not going to be impossible for a defendant to challenge to say I should have been assigned this claim against me, uh, but the defendant is going to have to work really hard to show that you know they made good offers and they were just rejected out of hand so i think this is a good decision uh, and, and, and key to remember because it shows us just how difficult it's going to be for a a challenge to be launched against decision making but i think if, if you're representing office holders uh, the advice you want to give is make sure you document um why why you're making decisions uh, various factors that you've got uh, weighing up in determining whether to assign, for example, to a given party. Obviously, that's probably going to come down to um, a, a pure balance sheet exercise of who's offering, going to offer more, uh, what's going to be better for the creditors. Um, and I think if you're if you're representing someone looking to challenge, um, it's ensuring that they've actually engaged in whatever process um, the liquidator has set up uh, in order to get around and not effectively fail at the hurdle of well, you say you would have bought this, but you didn't, and you didn't make any offers. So your claim is effectively going to fail. Um, and then finally, uh, turning to um, a case, I think a lot of us in the insolvency sphere uh, were waiting a long time for, uh, which is a Supreme Court decision in uh, BTI and Sequana. Um, very briefly, the facts of this case were that a director, uh, directors calls a company to distribute a dividend to its only shareholder, which extinguished the debt owed by that shareholder to the company. Uh, at the time of that uh, uh, distribution, the company was solvent on balance sheet or cash flow basis. However, it did have a long term contingent liability, which was uncertain in, in amount and an insurance portfolio of an uncertain value. And therefore, at the time of the distribution, there was a real risk. Uh, that it might become insolvent in the future. Uh, BTI uh, was the assignee of the company's claim to recover the dividend. Uh, and what BTI argued was the making of this dividend was in breach of what's called the creditor duty uh, because the directors failed to consider creditor interests at a time when the company was at real risk of being insolvent. Uh, this case went us all the way to, up to the Supreme Court. Uh, effectively, there were four issues for the Supreme Court to decide. First of all, is there a duty to creditors? Secondly, can that duty apply to the making of a dividend, uh, which is otherwise lawful? Uh, thirdly, what is the content of the creditor's duty? And fourth, was it engaged in this case? On issue one, the court noted, uh, the majority noted, that section 172.1 of Companies Act 2006 uh, requires directors to act in the way they consider in good faith uh, would most likely promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. Uh, it codified the long established common law fiduciary duty to act in good faith uh, in the interests of the company. Uh, the court held that the duty was modified by the rule that a company's interests uh, are taken to include the interests of its creditors as a whole. Um, and, and what the court said is that this is not a freestanding duty, uh, but an aspect of the director's duty to the company. Um, what the court also noted is that the shareholders uh, cannot authorize or ratify a transaction that is uh, carried out in breach of the 
duty to consider the interests of the creditors. Um, in terms of whether it can apply to the payment of an otherwise lawful dividend, uh, the court unsurprisingly said yes. Um, the, the reality is it's, of course, you can declare a dividend lawfully. Um, that's merely a, a sort of a procedural uh, process to ensure that it's properly minuted, uh, properly res there's proper resolutions and authorizations in place, um, that certain capitalization requirements are met. Uh, but the fact is, it can it can still be carried out in breach of a creditor's uh, interests um, in the event that that duty is engaged. Um, turning to the third issue of well, this interest to consider the uh, this duty to consider the interests of creditors, when does it arise? What the majority says is it arises where a company is insolvent, bordering on insolvency, uh, or faced with inevitable insolvency uh, or administration. Um, at that point, the directors must consider uh, the interests of the creditors and balance that against the shareholders' interests. And, and what the court says is that the greater the difficulties the, co the company finds itself in financially, the more the directors should prioritize uh, the interests of creditors. Um, and the interests are those of the general body of creditors, not of individual creditors in special circumstances. Um, Lady Arden in her major minority judgment uh, went further and said that the duty isn't just to consider their interests but in fact, a duty not to harm their interests. Um, but obviously, that that's a majority, a, mi a minority um, ruling, and not and not the decision of the majority, which is simply consider their interests. Um, the the duty is definitely uh, triggered, and actually, the interest of creditors become paramount. The court said, once liquidation or administration is inevitable. So effectively, what we have is a on the one hand a sliding scale. Uh, test, uh, which is if the company is uh, maybe insolvent, bordering insolvency, uh, but in fact it's not inevitable that it's going to be wound up or placed into administration. It's this: you got to, a duty to consider the interests, and the and the worst of picture, the more important they are. But there's no real; it's got very hard to to consider. Well, what what are the what are the steps there? At which point the interests become more and more important. Um, the only bright line is where it is inevitable the company is going to be liquidated or placed into administration, the interests of the creditors become paramount. Um, in, in terms of whether it's something the directors uh, have to know, ought to know, uh, the majority says it's they know or ought to know. Um, there was in the minority, Lord Reed and Lady Arden, who said it, 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 they left open the question of whether directors have to know that the company is insolvent or bordering on insolvency or it is inevitable that is going to be placed into liquidation or administration. Um, in, in my view, I think that that's unlikely to be workable in practice. I think it effectively will create a strict liability regime um, that regardless of your state of knowledge as to how your company is faring financially, uh, you may be liable to creditors in, in, in the event that certain transactions or actions you take harm their interests. Um, I, I doubt it's going to be applied in that way. And it's, it's probably going to be a case that's applied using uh, whether directors knew or ought to have known um, the state of the company's finances. Um, on the facts of uh, BTI and Tequana, what the court held is because uh, the company wasn't actually insolvent or bordering on insolvency, the creditor's duty interest did not apply uh, and the claim failed. The, the fact that there was a contingent liability that created a real risk of insolvency at some point in the future is simply insufficient uh, to trigger the duty to consider interest. Um, overall, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a good decision. It helps to clarify um, that this duty exists. It gives a framework for, how it, for when it will be triggered. Um, in terms of its actual application, obviously because it wasn't triggered in this case, what the majority said is obiter, um, it's likely going to need some further development uh, in the lower courts and perhaps in the appeal courts again, particularly about the sliding the sliding scale um, of when 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 you have to consider uh, and the weight of consideration to the interests. Um, as a bonus festive present, I've given you a sixth case here on my slides. 
uh, which is the case of MI squared, uh, because, well, when we say creditor's interest, what actually, in, what is the interest uh, we mean? Uh, and that's a recent High Court decision uh, that confirms that the primary creditor interest is the interest of creditors to be paid in full and on time. Of course, that almost seems obvious. <laughs> All creditors want to be paid in full and on time. Um, obviously, when you're in financial difficulties, being able to do that may not may not be the easiest. But of course, the worse your financial difficulties, the more you're going to have to take a view as to whether you continue trading or not. Um, but there you have it. That's a wistful stop tour of what I think are the five key cases uh, this year that you should remember going forward. Um, overall, very practical outcomes. Uh, I think useful uh, guidance uh, for anyone practicing in insolvency litigation. Um, certainly, it, it means when we give advice, um, overall theme, I think, is uh, document, uh, document decision making, whether you're a director, uh, whether you are a office holder, um, uh, and ensure you engage with processes, uh, whether you're a director, an office holder, or indeed a creditor. Um, and so, uh, without further ado, I think it's time to hand over to Piers. Well, I will ask one question just to get a bit of repartee going between us, and so you can uh, see we've uh, known our staff. Uh, James, you, you mentioned um, the Al Sald case, and I, I thought that was interesting um, in respect of the place of residence um, business, uh, just because um, although he had resided there, uh, yeah. and so um, it uh, that was sufficient to make it a place of residence. It hadn't been used for residence within the three years leading up to the petition. So presumably the line of, of reasoning is that um, uh, it certainly was a place of residence. And the thing about a place of residence is that, you know, you, you can leave for some time, but there's always the possibility you can return. It doesn't it cease being a place of residence at yes. the last time you stay. That status sort of rolls on for a bit. However, again, on the factual matrix of El Saud, um, it was fairly clear that he probably wasn't going to return because of the, the prospects of contempt of court. So we have here a place that is, which is not being used um, for residents uh, within the last three years. And there's very strong reason to suppose that it, it probably won't be used for residents again. Under yeah. that circumstances, if you'd been on the other side, how would you have disclaimed the, uh, a place of residence in this circumstance? Well, if I was on the other side, I think the, 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 the quickest way to have displaced that was actually to put in evidence. Um, the, 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 there was a bit of an own goal um, by the debtor by failing to put in any evidence in the challenge. So while a challenge was mounted, there was no evidence to show um, perhaps why he would never return. I think the reality is, you know, the, the court in that case was looking back almost some 30, almost 40 years uh, and showed a, a regularity um, and a degree of permanence to at least uh, the debtor coming to the UK and to London on a semi-regular basis. Uh, and while that had stopped in recent years, um, he still had permission if he ever was back to use his mother's house. So um, I think I think if I was advising them, I'd advise them to put in evidence. Um, the, the other thing to note is this is sim that was simply at the permission stage. So while it might be easier for the petitioning creditor to serve out and to, to cross the jurisdictional threshold at the permission to serve out stage. The fact is there, if you challenge again at the substantive hearing of the bankruptcy petition, um, the jurisdiction point suddenly becomes a uh, balance probability standard. So it's going to be harder for the petitioner, I think, to maybe show that there is sufficient uh, connection with the England, with England and Wales and the jurisdiction uh, to, to, to ground the bankruptcy petition jurisdiction. Um, that said, again, if your debtor doesn't put in evidence, you're on the back foot already. Um, you know, it does seem that the courts are willing to take a rather wide view um, as to what counts as a factor. Um, and I think, you know, at all the time you're looking at regularity, length, control. Um, those are touchstones of having a residence but of course it's not the same as being resident in the jurisdiction so you know it's it's a little bit more of a nebulous concept i think great fantastic thanks for that james um, we just had one uh, question quickly from louise um, just asking about the name of the bonus case uh, james mentioned uh, i can yeah. see from the slides it was uh, mi squared limited in king that's uh, right and the citation is 2022 ewhc 
331 column. But don't worry too much if you're missing those because the slides will be um, available for distribution later. So thank you for that. Okay, so what I'm going to be running through today is just four perhaps smaller cases that um, highlighted interesting features that can help you um, prepare for cases that deal a, a little bit more with the, uh, the, the practical side and uh, the day in day out uh, life of grind as a junior. Um, so the first of these cases uh, in our sort of brief review of 2022 uh, is going to be um, uh, Ray JD Group Limited. Um, and this was an interesting one dealing with uh, knowledge. Um, so this was an application by liquidators of the company um, seeking relief under sections 212 and 213 of the Insolvency Act 1986. Um, so a breach of fiduciary duty uh, and fraudulent trading. Uh, and the respondent was the uh, sole director of the company at all the relevant times. Uh, the liquidator's case um, was primarily that the respondent had been uh, a knowing party to the carrying on of the company's business with uh, an intent to defraud HMRC, um, as the company had been involved in a number of transactions with overseas companies uh, relating to the missing trader, uh, intra-community back fraud, so uh, spiralling goods around people who, who don't exist uh, effectively. Um, the relevant test was whether the director had been uh, dishonestly causing uh, the company's participation in the fraud. Um, and that's using the, the two-stage test first of determining the actual state of the director's beliefs about the transactions that the company was taking part in. Uh, and secondly, determining whether this conduct um, was honest or dishonest by the objective uh, standards of ordinary people. Um, and that was um, uh, effectively going to, you know, whether there was the, the, the actual knowledge that this was going on, um, that, that he was involved in wrongdoing. Now, the respondent's case was that he lacked either actual or constructive knowledge of the fraud um, because he'd not known any of the other parties to the transaction chain. Um, so effectively going, well, you know, if I, if I don't know who I'm trading with, how can I possibly know, you know what they're doing with goods at the next stage along? I, I can't be involved in this, this um, uh, alleged um, missing trader intra-community fraud because, you know, I, I don't know the people I'm dealing with as far as I'm concerned. They, they could be anyone and could be um, entirely good faith traders. Um, and the court rejected this argument on, on a fairly interesting basis. Um, they considered that um, even if the respondent hadn't had any knowledge uh, of the other parties in the chain, the respondent's willful failure uh, to conduct proper due, due diligence checks uh, suggested that the respondent ha had a very good idea that the goods sold um, were going into um, some sort of scheme or, or fraudulent chain, and he was deliberately trying to avoid being fixed with um, knowledge of the events. Um, so although his attempt was to say, look, I, I can't have actual or even constructive knowledge because, um, look, I don't even know the identity of the parties I'm dealing with, the, the steps he took um, uh, to avoid acquiring that knowledge were so deliberate that uh, the court felt that they could infer from that that he did in fact know. So um, evidence of the steps he was taking was evidence of the knowledge itself. It wasn't even necessary to say, look, there's constructive knowledge, you know, you can work it out from all the circumstances. It is, he must have known already by the way that he was acting. Um, and so that's fairly useful because it means that you don't have to um, uh, sort of deal with some of the more complex aspects of uh, the usual test for dishonesty, um, you know, whether this conduct was honest or dishonest by the objective standards of ordinary people um, and the actual state of the director's beliefs, because obviously then you're gonna to have to deal with um, complicated um, evidential issues like what you know, what were his actual beliefs? How did he feel about this conduct? Um, what would an, uh, an ordinary person think of this conduct? Here, it's simply sufficient to say, look, what he's doing is is enough that um, it is so deliberate, it's so careful that we can say, yes, he has knowledge. Um, and then uh, the other two questions um, uh, fall away a little bit. Um, and so that's a useful tip when preparing cases because um, it can effectively um, allow you to say, um, where we have enough evidence that we think could lead the court to infer someone must know um, about what's going on. Um, we aren't necessarily going to have to dive into um, uh, in more care uh, the actual state of, of the director's beliefs about sort of uncertain factors um, because you're, you're inferring that those uncertain factors are in fact certain. Um, so that's the, the first interesting uh, case that we have before us. Ray Rossi. Um, which uh, 2022 uh, England and Wales High Court uh, 1053 uh, Chancery, um, which was about how uh, to prove the quantum uh, of a particular debt. 
So this was a bankruptcy petition uh, presented against uh, Mr. Rossi. Uh, and uh, subsequently, uh, as um, often happens, the virtual meeting of creditors was held and the creditors are considering uh, a proposal for an IVA. Now, the proposal was rejected, having failed uh, to reach the uh, usual three quarters majority. Now, the applicant uh, in the matter appealed to have the decision set aside um, on grounds of material irregularity. And so um, what he was saying was effectively um, he was owed more than had been admitted um, by the nominee of the proposed voluntary arrangement. And if that had been accounted for, um, then uh, the, the majority would have been reached essentially because um, you know, his, his debt was, was larger than um, had been admitted, counted more on the weight. Now, uh, the nominee, although neutral on uh, whether the discrepancy uh, was a genuine debt owed between the debtor and the applicant, um, noted that it was the responsibility of creditors to satisfy the chair of the meeting as to the amount owed. Um, the applicant uh, hadn't provided um, a, a full grounding um, for the amount of debt set out in proposal, um, but uh, only sort of justified a, a smaller part of it, and so had been admitted to that amount. Now, the applicant's case, um, uh, in response was effectively, um, well, look, this, this has been admitted by the debtor in question. The debtor's you know, not contested this before. You can see previous correspondence where um, the debtor's gone away and said, um, look, I think this is you know, about the sum I owed. Uh, and this was the sum that had, had been put forward um, to the nominee from which the nominee then produced the proposal. Um, so the court's uh, decision was that, uh, yes, the burden does lie on the creditor to make the claim. They, they can't simply rely on the pro proposal the debtor has put forward. And the chair of the meeting has to go, um, they have to um, be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that, you know, look, yes, uh, this is real debt, this is actually what's owed, and this is how I'm going to uh, assign weights to um, all of the votes in the creditors' meeting. Um, and uh, if the creditor doesn't take active steps to um, satisfy the chair of that, then you know they, they can't really complain if they go away and they find that they've got a lesser weight in voting than they thought that they were going to have. So the useful uh, lesson here is um, you, you just can't rest on your, your laurels in these particular cases. You need to, um, um, when there is a creditors meeting, have a good case put together and ready to go as to um, why you are owed this debt, all of the basis for it. Um, uh, in such a form that you think it is going to be sufficient on the balance of probabilities uh, to persuade uh, the chair uh, that that is the weight you should be afforded. Uh, so next up is uh, Thomas and Metro Bank, or uh, Ray Ilya Yurov, uh, 2022 uh, England and Wales High Court, 21-22 uh, Chancery Division. Uh, and this uh, was an interesting one uh, that dealt with uh, legal privilege. And there's quite a few um, interesting uh, strands of analysis going on in this particular case. Uh, so the background to this was the uh, trustees in the bankruptcy of a Mr. Europe uh, seeking an order under Section 366 of the Insolvency Act for the uh, respondents which was uh, primarily Mr. Yurov's wife, Mrs. Yurova, but, but also a, a number of banks that uh, Mr. Yurov and Mrs. Yurova banked with, um, to appear before the court and give an account of their dealings with Mr. Yurov, um, you know, with the further goal of um, finding potential assets that might have been um, hidden away or just um, following up leads to make sure that there was um, nothing untoward going on. Now, the trustees relied in their application on part of a longer legal advice um, relating to the regime of spousal interest in assets under Russian law, uh, and they provided a small summary of uh, part of that advice um, as part of the grounds of their application while stating that they, they didn't waive privilege, um, because uh, obviously the pursuit of um, uh, any uh, assets that um, might have been um, in Russia would depend on how Russia categorised the spousal interest in, the, in those assets. So it, it was necessary to have some of the, this grounding in Russian law. Now, uh, Mrs. Yurova applied for disclosure of this legal advice uh, on the basis that by referring to it uh, in her application and relying on it um, as a ground, um, the trustees had waived uh, privilege over it, regardless of the fact that they'd A, only summarised it and briefly, uh, rather than even providing a, a specific excerpt, um, and B, um, uh, setting it, uh, aside the fact that they said, look, we, we don't intend to waive privilege over this, and that's why we're only providing this, this kind of um, condensed version. Now, the trustees gave several reasons as to why they shouldn't have to front up this advice, um, namely that uh, the, the advice in full um, contained uh, sections addressing other aspects of um, Mr. Euro's bankruptcy. And so effectively they could tip people off as to the avenues of investigation that the, the trustees might be looking at 
um, uh, where they were going to try uh, finding anything that might have been hidden away. Um, secondly, that the trustees weren't ordinary litigants, but um, in their capacity as trustees in bankruptcy were in fact officers of the court. And so they're already under a duty um, not to give an unfair impression of the court, uh, and that included an unfair impression of the advice that they'd received. Uh, and finally, and thirdly, that the advice had uh, not actually been uh, itself deployed in court and merely a summary of it with the, the full matter um, only to be heard at the uh, Section 366 hearing proper. Um, so effectively saying, look, yes, this advice is going to come out. Um, at this stage, we're, we're effectively just going through something pre preliminary. It's not necessary for us to boot out the whole thing. And the court can be fine with that because it knows that it's going to get heard in full uh, later. Uh, the court rejected these arguments. Uh, it considered that uh, waiting until the uh, section 366 hearing and the advice actually being heard rather than merely referred to um, would just invite a bunch of applications for adjournment to the last minute, uh, wasting court time and costs for both sides. And it would obviously at the section 366 hearing be uh, one of the first matters the court would deal with um, the moment that the actual advice was um, uh, referred to in full and uh, there were going to be, you know, immediately be applications relating to that, uh, uh, particularly um, to allow uh, Mrs. Yorova to respond to it and deal with it. Uh, and so on that basis, it really needed to be up front so that, that she could respond to it properly at this stage. Um, it wasn't sufficient for the trustees to say they were under a duty to the court to give a fair impression of the material, um, because um, uh, an important duty of uh, courts is that um, fairness must be demonstrated rather than merely assumed. Uh, and so the fact that that was their duty um, didn't excuse them from actually having to take all the steps to show that their duty um, was being carried out. Accordingly, the court ordered disclosure uh, of the sections of the advice, um, which had led to the summaries given by the trustees in the application, but further and interestingly, also the instructions which had led to those parts of the advice uh, being given, so that the context by which that advice uh, had been produced could be understood, uh, and uh, Monsieur uh, could see exactly uh, what questions had been asked to produce the answer that, that led to the trustee summary to make sure that nothing had been taken out of uh, context. Uh, however, the sections and instructions not relating uh, to the summarised part um, could be redacted. Um, so the lesson here is uh, firstly, chopping up advice um, to meet disclosure requirements um, might be uh, difficult. Uh, you know, uh, typically when counsel's writing an opinion, it's going to be uh, interwoven, various sections might refer to each other. Um, obviously, um, we will try our best to uh, segment things where possible. Um, but if you are particularly concerned that parts of something might come up for exposure, well, uh, you can flag that up to counsel and say, look, this particular part, um, to, to the best you can, can you try isolating this from the rest of the device so that if we do have to cut it out or redact the rest, it's easy to do, uh, easy to do so. Um, secondly, beware the fact that instructions might also come up for grabs. Um, there's always uh, a need to think, um, is this uh, at risk? Um, is there anything in our instructions that might hint at potential um, avenues we're looking at? Um, how clearly and cleanly can we uh, divide up uh, our instructions so that each particular topic is not hinting at the other topics? Um, uh, and again, that might help you um, prevent people from effectively being tipped off. Very final case uh, for today um, is just going to be um, Atkinson um, uh, as a trustee in the bankruptcy of uh, Laurel uh, against Laurel, uh, 2022 England and Wales High Court 433 uh, Chancery Division. Um, and uh, this one is particularly interesting um, because uh, counsel, or one of the counsel in this case, um, uh, was my co-host, uh, James, um, who has uh, very kindly uh, volunteered uh, this case as an interesting one to talk about. Um, and he's not wrong because uh, this uh, dealt with um, a uh, relatively um, underexamined um, uh, point. Um, it concerned an application by a trustee in bankruptcy um, to vary an income payments agreement and the um, IPA included the usual obligation uh, to notify the trustee of any increase in income uh, and a provision for the IPA to be varied by the court. Now, uh, the trustee's application uh, had three supporting witness statements which uh, made the best of the material available to them to assess the respondent's income and domestic needs. Uh, and the respondent, um, by contrast, had two witness statements, which the, the court frankly considered um, rather incomplete and unsatisfactory. Um, there had been an order previously uh, for the respondent to provide specific details of current income and uh, maintenance towards children, amongst other things. And that order just hadn't been complied with on time. Um, so uh, the respondent falling behind there. Under the circumstances, the court considered that there was good reason to vary the uh, 
agreements. Um, but the point of contention was whether the court had the power to do so retrospectively, uh, taking uh, effect before the date of the order. This had obviously taken such a, a fair while to kind of uh, chew through, tumble through the courts that there was a significant gap between when the application was actually made and, and when the hearing was that meant uh, if the IPA was varied from the date of the hearing, then it would be missing a you know, very significant chunk of, of um, assets. Uh, now, James uh, took that exact line and successfully persuaded the uh, court that um, uh, allowing it to be made um, retrospectively um, would prevent this lacuna where a, a problem issue could effectively be um, solved or uh, hidden away uh, by the respondent having been put on notice by the application um, before the date of the hearing. Uh, but further and interestingly, the court considered that a variation could also uh, take effect going back as far as the date of the original order, um, provided there was the detail to ground this, although um, in Laurel itself that detail was absent. Uh, the court noted that this would provide, uh, uh, this would require a, a proper forensic exercise to be undertaken of uh, income and expenditure over the period for which variation was sought. Um, so the lesson here is that if there's a ma big material difference in the time between um, you know, when you suspect uh, more assets or more income might have emerged um, and the, the point at which you know, you've started making this application or, or the point at which uh, a hearing um, is coming up, you want to have taken the time to gone away and really dig in as much as possible as you can to be able to um, present this information in an easy to digest format that a judge who is dealing with a relatively brief hearing doesn't want to go through you know, huge amounts of, of documents to piece it together themselves can say, ah, look, this is the rough sketch of the income and expenditure. Um, this is the sort of order that I want to be making and uh, I'm satisfied I can do this because under the circumstances, the other side hasn't been forthcoming. And the better that you're able to piece together that information, the further back um, you'll be able to go. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, if you need forensic accounting uh, support on that, that may be something to consider. So that is the uh, four interesting uh, cases, uh, smaller cases, raising key points from 2022. Um, uh, thank you all for listening. Um, I will give it uh, two, three minutes for questions, but I'm, I'm aware we're running uh, very uh, towards the end of time. Um, so if, if there are none fairly shortly, um, uh, thank you very much all for attending and uh, I wish you a pleasant Christmas. I'd like to just echo the thanks of attending this talk. Uh, this is the last junior programme of 2022. Uh, the junior program will start up again in the new year. Uh, look out for uh, announcements of, to the talks uh, on the usual channels uh, on the Radcliffe Chambers uh, LinkedIn in particular. Uh, I'd like to thank peers again and I'd like to thank you all for attending. Hope you found it interesting uh, and wish you a very happy remainder of 2022 and, and festive period uh, and all the best wishes for 2023.